Welcome to the Future Generations Podcast, providing you with the world-changing content necessary to inspire you, your family, and our planet to a life of optimal health potential. We'll help you make the choices that powerfully influence the lives you bring into this world. It's time to strengthen our resolve to do better now and for our future generations with your host, Dr. Stanton Hom. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Future Generations Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Stanton Hom, certified prenatal and pediatric chiropractor in San Diego, California, diplomate in the Academy Council of Chiropractic Pediatrics, graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, husband to my beautiful wife, Victoria, and daddy to my wonder-filled daughter, Alana Mayham. Welcome to episode 48S. In this episode, three West Point graduates highlight the atrocities occurring at the United States Military Academy from segregation to threats to leveraging privileges in medical care, our nation's premier leadership institution will not stop at anything to get 100% compliance for the COVID injection. All of us must listen to these stories, write our congressmen and women, because these measures have the potential to be expanded to the rest of the world in varying forms. Pam Long is the military health writer for the Children's Health Defense. She's a former Army veteran medical service corps officer commissioned with the United States Military Academy, class of 1997 at West Point. She consults with many state and national freedom advocacy organizations, including Colorado Health Choice Alliance and Military Freedom Keepers. You can contact her by email to any of these organizations or read her articles at CHD author Pam Long. Alex Zek is a writer speaker, holistic health coach. Alec speaks about health freedom, balancing mind, body, spirit, nutrition, and reconnecting with nature, childhood trauma, healing, natural health, and identifying and mitigating the effects of oppressive systems. He receives his Bachelor's of Science in Systems Engineering from the United States Military Academy at West Point. He is the CEO of Health Freedom for Humanity and the host of the Way Forward podcast. Okay, guys, this is a really important episode. I really need you to be paying as close of attention as possible. We are releasing this way ahead of other amazing interviews. Why? We're doing it because it is absolutely critical for the public to hear what's happening at the Academy. Uh, Three of us are are amazing, you know, in a sense that we all have looked at our time at West Point as something that is... A blip on the radar when in a, in a perspective in life, but it is a trajectory shift in a sense that the values that are instilled there, the values that are at the core of West Point should be the beacon for virtually the entire armed forces and really for the world in many respects. And what we're seeing at this uh, institution, our alma mater, is atrocious it is some of the most disgusting display of humanity and it is being paraded in marched in forced upon uh, several cadets Uh, pam is an expert of everything that happens to the military the armed forces even homeland security alex zek obviously you have to know him through our podcast but also if you have not been under hiding under a rock in the health freedom movement you've seen the entire Zach family, Health Freedom for Humanity, all sorts of amazing influences by by this gentleman and a great, great, great friend of mine. And so the three of us in our collective history, our collective experience have shown uh, very clearly through this conversation, not only highlighting what's happening there, but also what to do about it. This is really important to take action, take action in a big way. And at the same time, here's here's the end of it. And we talked about this toward the end, but before we get to that stage, is, is writing your Congress people, writing your senators, your representatives is super important because they respond to this. They hold oversight over the military academy. At this point, we don't really know what all the class breakdowns of the unjabbed are, but what we know is that the 139 um, that were in the sophomore class dwindled to 37 and it's down to under 15 uh, cadets who have um, been virtually in in, in standing up for their own rights but have been somehow able to 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 resist the force and the coercion and the threats and the leveraging of privileges and the leveraging of things that um, we are taught at west point never like to 
to violate uh, the health and well-being of your soldiers. You're taught never to violate some simple things as, as money, time, and privileges, and, and West Point is leveraging them. Full bird colonels threatening to uh, be the person who, who jabs these individuals in the arm, force vaccinating them. These leverages will be the model for healthcare. They will be the model for the rest of the armed forces. They will be, in some version or form, the model of how to get 100% compliance. And if you don't see that as a possibility of coming, then you um, need to wake up and you need to see that this academy used to be a place that was immune to such behaviors and such ways of treating their own people. And we're here to hold them accountable. Share this podcast far and wide. Um, Share it with any family member who has anything to do with the military because being connected with us, being connected with Pam is hugely important. And at the end of the day, we need to protect even those who signed up, especially those who signed up to serve um, freedom, to serve humanity, to serve the values of our country. And we need to because it is time is of the essence at this stage and freedom is um, not only something that we need to preserve for all of us in the civilian world, but the people who dedicate their lives to defending freedom as well. As always, everyone, rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Please share this episode, and mostly um, stay tuned. We have so many exciting things coming through. Next week's solo cast, the episode releasing on Friday, is going to have those announcements from new logo, rebranding, new sound engineer, all sorts of exciting things that are going to come into this second year of the Future Generations podcast of building this community. Thank you so much for helping us be um, sustaining this long. And at the same time, we have only just scratched the surface of what we're going to provide for you and what we're going to create for you. Stay tuned for next week's episode. And then on Monday, the following week, is when you will hear uh, how we have shifted, evolved, and changed in the most beautiful and powerful way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Cannot wait to share it all with you. This is a really special episode because the three of us are all West Point grads. And I, I joke all the time that every time I write an email to Pam, I'm standing at parade rest because you know, <laughs> I got to lock it up. And, you know, just in case, just in case it goes back to my, my beast barracks and getting hazed. But no, that wasn't beast because it's not firsties. But man, you were a plebe when she was a firstie, firstie. right? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so everybody listening, that's, that's basically me being a freshman and, and Pam being a senior, and that stuff doesn't really go away. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm just extra institutionalized. But uh, at 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 the end of the day, we had this idea to have this interview because the three of us have all been through the academy. We're all abreast to what's happening at the academy. No one as uh, informed as Pam is. And you wrote that article recently, Pam, that just expose so much of the the atrocities that are happening to cadets there and there's a there's a there's a pretty big misconception that we uh highlighted at the heart of freedom one which was that that you don't just sign your life away it's not like you don't have any sort of informed consent it's not that you're not supposed to be you know you're just not just a lab rat to be tested on and your article exposed so much of what's actually happening. And I don't, I don't know if you want to give a background or if you think this is a good way to start, Alec. But Yeah, I think so. I think if what's... Pam gave, gave her background just yeah. to that context, yeah. that'd be good. But also maybe even where you, where you come from and how you've, you've been involved in this whole movement. Because I would say, you know, arguably, if you hadn't been in this movement, maybe the rest of us wouldn't have a movement to actually be in at this stage. So go for it, Pam. Well... What brought me to this issue really was the vaccine injury of my youngest son. So, but what is happening currently is that this new experimental drug is affecting everyone, even people who may have not given a second thought to efficacy and safety in previous vaccines. So the situation at West Point, the cadets are being segregated that are unvaccinated, who have not agreed to choose the mRNA drug. So they are being put in a tent. They are mandated to wear a mask inside and out everywhere. And they have restrictions on their leave. They must give up most of their leave, like a week. And some of them have maybe two weeks over the summer training 
to quarantine. And really our mission here today is to discuss this. Is this, is this science or is this nonsense? And um, how do we convey to the public that this is not the way forward? This will spill over to the civilian world if we do not um, educate the public on what is happening here in these the segregation and discrimination of adults, of American citizens, of U.S. soldiers. And so, you know, there's some simple logistics involved. An antibody test could end this today. Most of these cadets were prior infected, most likely, either this past year or previously in their lives. And so that's what we're doing today. We're communicating to the public that we need some backlash to the Army chain of command, the West Point chain of command, to our other civilian universities who will be implementing similar measures, and also on the local level. We don't want this spilling over into our communities. It's, I think it's crazy because I started to read through, and I think I can't remember the timeline of events, but I remember there being, you know, roughly 700 cadets that had not received the shot. And then there were 139 and then there was 37. And then is it today like 15 or something like that? Is that the number? I'm hearing 15 at um, Camp Buckner for the, for that for training. 37, right? We don't really know yet about um, Beast Barracks, that incoming class. We know similar restrictions will be put on them. They will all start off wearing a mask until they're fully vaccinated over the course of five weeks, two doses. And I'm already communicating with parents of this incoming class that are very concerned about these policies. What are Pam, if, if, if you could give, give some more uh, insight into the information with regards to the, the head medical officer at West Point and some, the experience that some of the cadets have had interacting with her um, I, not even just from you in the article that you've read, I've also heard from other people who have talked to these cadets uh, who are unvaccinated and living in this, these conditions out at Camp Buckner um, that, that she has threatened them and, and coerced them heavily. And I wondered if you could give some insight into that. Of course. So in the military, there's a chain of command in everything, even in your medical decisions and your medical clearance that says you are fit and healthy to complete your duties and complete your mission and to do your job, unlike the civilian community. So we have Colonel Laura Dawson, who is the United States Military Academy medical officer, who is in that position of authority. Her background is podiatry. It is not infectious disease. And so you have cadets who need her approval for a surgery um, who are being denied that you cannot have this surgery because you're unvaccinated, despite the hypocrisy of other cadets who were positive for COVID were allowed to have surgeries that are essential for their job. When you're in the military, your physical well-being is essential to your job more than even in the civilian community. Um, and so then you also have examples, cadet reports of uh, threatening graduation that maybe you, if you're not vaccinated because you're a civilian doctor at home, your long-term provider that you have a relationship with and knows your health, um, maybe you're medically weak. Those type of insinuations um, are, are very upsetting. Clearly a cadet who has made it three days up to graduation is not medically weak. And um, just, and I, I'm, I'm appalled that this cadet in particular that I'm thinking of was sick. She went to the hospital for care and, you know, and she was berated and, and about her choice being infected with COVID to not get the vaccine in that sickness. I mean, that is a contraindication in and of itself. If you are sick, that is not the time to take on an experimental drug. And she had the backing of her long-term doctor. And so you, what you have is withholding medical care, um, threatening graduation. These are, this is appalling coercion. Yeah. And, and, and you won't experience this at the same level in the civilian world. You don't have one person who has this sort of power over you, um, but you do in the military. And I'm hearing it not just with the core cadets, I'm hearing it across all branches of the military that someone in the chain of command has decided 
this is best for their squad or their platoon or every 100% goal in their unit, and therefore restrictions are being placed on whether they can go to a special training that is required for their promotion or a TDY for something that is important to their job, a, a temporary duty station, PCSing, a permanent duty station, um, all of these things, um, like the carrot and the stick, they're, they're, it's all stick right now that you cannot, you cannot change your duty station, you cannot go to training, you might not be deployable, you cannot go to special schools that you are qualified for, we might remove you from your position. Um, all of these things are happening, not just with the academy, but with all of the branches of the military. And if I may, Stan, one more question. So You're fine. What are, what are some of the other things that you've seen to, to add more context to this situation? Because I know that the Army IG has sort of put out statements saying like, hey, here's the guidelines that we're going with with regards to this shot. We are not going to discriminate against anyone or create a situation or environment where it, there's a perception that you're being discriminated against if you don't want the vaccine. Um, but, but what we've seen in multiple duty stations now, especially at West Point, is the exact opposite, correct? So what you're seeing uh, with the chain of command and, and the IG has publicly said what, what the law says. The FDA has a long-term policy that no entity, including the military, can mandate an emergency use authorized drug. That would also include the PCR testing, which is under emergency use authorization. And so you have the IG and members of the chain of command at high levels reiterate, reiterating this law and the, that it's not legal to coerce. But then at the same time, you have, we have plenty of examples, starting with the Sergeant Major of the Army, telling publicly units and soldiers that, um, of course, we're going to incentivize people who get the vaccine. And you can, you can either interpret that, translate that as, we are offering incentives, meaning these people who are vaccinated can go to the gym and take full leave but you can also translate that as we are also coercing and offering punishments and restrictions for people who choose not to take the vaccine, where their leave is restricted, they can't access the dining facility or the gym or, you know, at, at, like at West Point, going back to West Point, anyone who was not vaccinated at the recent graduation in May had to wear a mask. I mean, so they're, they're, they're saying they're upholding the How law. Humili How humiliating that is during your graduation, like for, for everyone listening, I mean, obviously college grad, graduation in and of itself is a monumental event, but like the West Point, the theatrics that come with it, like usually a president, vice president, the secretary of defense will come speak at your graduation. And that's such a, a culminating event. You're starting your career in the army thereafter. And I mean, I'm sure all of you remember graduation, like, like the back of your hand. <clears throat> and it's uh, to, to, to be singled out like that for not receiving this product is is unbelievable unbelievable i mean you could even add that the masks are also an eua right they're also emergency use authorized they can't be as is the pcr test too yeah exactly and so at every level there is federal law that protects us from being mandated to do any of these things mm -hmm. and what i what i was thinking about was just back in <laughs> one of the reasons why i got out of the military is like you get eventually you're on staff. You're not at the ground level. Once I went to, from platoon leader to battalion staff as the field artillery, and you know, red legs. Oh, me too. Me and you, Alec, right? Once I was on battalion staff, it's all just, it's all statistics, right? Like, what's your status on this? Like, are you green to green? Are you like, are you ready to, you know, are you guys combat ready? And they're leveraging deployments too. And the patients that are in my practice, you can't deploy. It's like so weird when you think about combat readiness. Why inject something into somebody to, tend, to then say they can deploy when in reality you might be compromising because it's an actual experiment, right? But on the opposite end, I'm looking at data, right? I heard in the, uh, a podcast with uh, Cheryl Atkinson recently, and she was including National Guard, and she said, yeah, for the Army, it's 14% it's uptake right now. And when you think about that number and you think about standards and you think about 100% and you look at West Point where they've gone, say it is 700 to 139 to 37 to 15. What are all the best practices that you did to get to 100%? And when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter who the 15 are. 
It doesn't matter about their sovereignty. It doesn't matter about their body autonomy. It's let's get this job done and then let's use that as a model for the rest of the military. And then like you're saying, Pam, which everybody should be paying attention to is models used because it's not like this has been in, in, in the background. There are public health officials at the federal level saying we need to hold the carrot in front of people in order to help them win their freedoms, freedoms back. If we give them too much freedom, we're not going to be able to leverage. And it's like, wow, like so West Point is actually doing this and they are actually getting to that level of 100 percent. And the models that they use, how, how do they not bleed over in some form or fashion to the rest of the world? I don't know how. Right. And that's where we come in to convey to the public, this, this is one of our premier institutions, an institution of duty, honor, country. And these cadets are valued at up to $500,000 in educational investment to the U.S. Army and to the nation that taxpayers provide that education. These are, these are adults who are selected for high performance in leadership, athletics, and academia. And they go on to lead our entire Army alongside their ROTC um, you know, components. And so to think that if we can treat these high caliber level of citizens who, who signed up to volunteer to serve their country, if we can treat them like this, we can round them up from their units, their homes, where they were living in open bay barracks, and we can say, today now you live in a tent, you live with a, you know, among mixed ranks, which is also a form of humiliation that the cadre is living with their subordinates, and you're living co-ed, which has its own concerns. As a woman, I will tell you that um, young women in that position I have concerns for, that um, they are living in a crowded tent um, all summer with um, their male counterparts, with, with, you know, there's a whole long list of issues there um, with young people in, in a stressful situation. Um, it's just a hot mess. And so... If we can do this to um, the, this high caliber of personnel, we can do this to the adults at civilian colleges. We can do this to people in our communities. Like the line has been crossed. We need to say the line has been crossed. And, and Pam, if you could, because um, I think I think back to the article that you wrote for Children's Health Defense, and that's the other thing for the people listening. Pam uh, is a contributor to the uh, the Defender Children Health Children's Health Defense, um, their I guess journal or newspaper, if you will. Um, and Pam has written a number of fantastic articles for them. Uh, one of them was the Army Town Hall that was done, where they had the I think it was a Sergeant Major of the Army. They had the lead. Um, scientific, what, what was he, scientific analyst or scientific something that, that spoke? An Army MedCom officer, chief officer. Okay, chief officer for MedCom. And then they had an unvaccinated uh, service member, a vaccinated service member, and then a person who was undecided on whether he wanted to get the vaccine or not on a panel. And you tore apart that, uh, that, that discussion that they had with actual data and actual published science with regards to these shots. So the messaging that soldiers are getting on this topic is inherently flawed because it is completely not based in science or data. And you showed that in your article. And I wanted to see if you could touch on why is it, like considering the, the, the cadets being coerced so heavily to receive this and then what the data shows on, on uh, herd immunity or, or what have you, and then also why these cadets are not at risk, uh, even using their own data, if you buy into that data, even using their own data, these cadets are not in a risk population whatsoever for this disease. I wondered if you could touch on the data and why this is so ridiculous to coerce 100% compliance uh, for these cadets and for the Army. Well, as you said, this age group, young, fit, healthy, uh, no uh, major contraindications like being elderly, having a comorbid condition, being obese. They just don't have any of the risk factors. Um, so they're just not a population at risk in general. 
And so we could also, we could look at so many different data points in this cost benefit analysis. One, um, we were seeing breakthrough cases in, in highly 100% vaccinated populations. So the, this ideology that is being dogmatically, you know, promoted to cadets and members of our military in a very flawed way, much like we saw with anthrax. So anyone who knows the history of anthrax and that disaster amongst our armed forces, um, I've also written about that. This is the same thing, um, except for worse, in that, in that we're promoting that it's safe. We don't have long-term data. We can point to 17 years of research on mRNA um, drugs in the animal studies, and, and, and frankly, it's frightening. What could the possibility of an antibody-dependent enhancement epidemic this fall across our entire military because of this zealous you know, approach to reach that 100% goal and get, you know, maybe a top lock on your review for promotion without actually looking at, you know, the risks, the contingency of what have we done to the entire force that could possibly um, put us in a security issue this winter when viruses are, you know, wild strains of coronavirus and influenza strains and all just our normal cold and flu viruses are circulating. How will their immune systems react? We have no idea, really, but with humans. But when you look at the animal data, it, it's frightening. We have a security risk problem, I believe. So we, so we look at the cadets. Do they have an individual risk? No. We look at the other side, the worst case scenario. This is what the military, this is what I was trained to do, to look at individual risk, to look at the unit risk. Um, how does a 97% vaccination you know, uptake how, do, how are those 3% putting the herd at risk? They are not. There's not a core risk here for the core cadets. And then Army-wide, have we put our entire force at risk of antibody-dependent enhancement? I think we have. Especially considering the context of there's already been upwards of 300,000 VAERS reports, and we all know that VAERS is severely underreported. Um, and, and again, like you said, the long-term data is not there for this product. And then according to the own cl the clinical trials, right, um, it was not shown to confer immunity and it was not shown to reduce transmission. This is only supposedly of benefit to the person that is receiving it, and, these, and, and that's at reducing symptoms. And these people um, that we're, we're discussing, these cadets and these service members, are typically not at risk. I think the last time I checked, and it was a while ago, there were five times the amounts of, of suicides in, in the Army this past year and a half than there were COVID deaths. And we're so narrow focused on the COVID situation when in general, the force is not at risk for this disease. And we are seeing an epidemic of mental health across all age groups in the, what is the most vulnerable age group for mental health crisis? 18 to 24 year olds. Yeah. So we're, t we've had, you know, I live in Colorado we had to stop the aggressive quarantining and isolation policies at the United States Air Force Academy last year, not because the Air Force wanted to, because they, it, it leaked to the public through parents that two cadets, two Air Force cadets had taken their lives, and then they were forced to. So, you know, the military sometimes makes decisions based in a vacuum they just have this little funnel from the CDC and the Department of Defense, and they follow orders, and, and they follow orders well. They want to hit that 100% goal, and medicine is not one-size-fits-all. We cannot say that 100% of these cadets or anyone in our military or anyone in our civilian population should receive this vaccine based on their own contraindication. But also, like you mentioned, VAERS, we know that adverse reactions are happening, um, 5,000 deaths, 200,000 adverse reactions. These are serious. And the media will tell you that it's slight pain and um, you know swelling at the injection site. No, I would encourage you, I find when I tell people the actual solutions and answers, they, they reject it. But when I say, you might want to go look at this yourself, when people look at the actual data in VAERS, and um, a user-friendly version of that is openvaers.com um, because the database is not user-friendly, the government version. 
So go look at the list of injuries. We're talking heart conditions. We're talking debilitating disabilities that people will be living with for the rest of their lives. We're talking about heart attacks and strokes, anaphylaxis. Um, they're serious. And you won't believe it unless you personally go and look at the various data. And it's wild to think that, you know, <laughs> the risk benefit, whatever that, 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 that dichotomy or that kind of comparison, it's, it's obvious when you look at the information, but then you start to see things like, you know, the FDA hearing from experts that this is going to be and is problematic to kids, to people that are younger. And it's it, it, the word expert and then the FDA, it's like, yes, they're probably hearing all these things, but at that ground level, like you're saying, Pam, I look at, I look at West Point, it is in its own little microcosm. And I used to look at it with such re like high regard because of just how much sweat equity it is to get in. And then while you're there, just to persevere at all, like is remarkable, even if you're the goat, right? Even if you're the last in the class or whatever, it's like, it, it, it takes so much out of a, a, a human being that for me, I'm looking at these 4,000 cadets and the level of indoctrination, and then they go to lead the army. And then what happens in the future? What happens in five years when the next pandemic of the you know century comes through or whatever they call it, you know, and th they, they know the model. And well, if they succumb to it, you know, versus standing up to it, it's wild to me to think about that. Well, even to be more short term minded, think about this winter. Um, totally. An emergency situation. Who do we rely upon in a mass casualty or a situation or a martial law situation? We are relying on our emergency responders and our military, our active duty and our reserve components. And so what happens when we have an emergency situation, potentially this fall, where a couple of scenarios, I mean, let's just play through a couple of them. I'm sure you can think of some too, where our hospitals are overrun and we have medical units like the ones I served in, and I can't deploy my unit because they're, they're all struggling with their health because of antibody dependent enhancement. I can't respond to the civilian population. I'm, my unit is non-deployable. So that's one scenario. Uh, another scenario would be, you know, if these, the, these are the leaders of our army. And if they have been taught that it is acceptable to coerce people into vaccination, these are the people coming to your town. They have been taught it is acceptable to remove you from your home, to put you in a tent and to limit all sorts of freedoms, your freedom of movement, um, until you take that vaccine. Um, both of those scenarios are nightmare scenarios for me. The other, the other thing to consider too that I've thought about quite a bit lately is that like when it comes to the military's focus on peer-to-peer uh, -peer threats, right? We, we talk about China, Russia, and North Korea. That's what we were over and over again, just beaten into our heads. <laughs> Um, at least when I was in. For you guys, it was probably different. Um, I always joke that if uh, we were all three still in, you guys would be brigade commanders and I would just be a staff captain probably, <laughs> probably one of your assistants or something. But oh, you'd be Pam's aide. <laughs> I'd be Pam's aide. I would be Pam's aide. Exactly. So, <laughs> exactly. And I would be informing you guys on, hey, here's something to consider, sir, ma'am. So with that, I, I always think about how China, for example, wants nothing to do with these mRNA products. They have not been using these mRNA products, which says something in and of itself. And then we discuss what's go what was going on, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And even in terms of a national security risk um, or, or allowing nefarious actors to subvert our institutions, our three-letter agencies, our, the Department of Defense, that is a, a very serious consideration. And it's, it's interesting to me that we don't see really any, at least not on the surface, any critical thought being given. Um, and we teach critical thinking so, mu so much amongst the, uh, the officer corps or, or the corps of cadets, um, the ability to critically think, to take on information and really discern for yourself what is the optimal solution with this. And I see none of that being done 
with regards to these products, especially like it's just so crazy to me, especially considering the fact that these cadets and these service members are not at risk, right? And then on top of that, according to federal regulations, it is up to them individually whether they want to receive this product or not because it is still under emergency use. Even with all of that, the data that exists, we are still seeing these heavy coercion measures. We are still seeing segregation, discrimination. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable to me. It's, it's actually astounding to see the military uh, su succumb to this in so many ways. Well, it does beg the question of who's calling the shots? That's... Is the science calling the shots? Because um, wh why are cadets and, and military members wearing a mask to protect the vaccinated? Um, you know, again, I live here in Colorado, and we are reminded every year by the CDC that during our wildfires and forest fires, that a mask will not protect you from the mm -hmm. smoke, the heavy smoke. The particles are too large. The, the, they will go right through a mask. So don't think that you are safe if you stay in your home surrounded by wildfire smoke. With that a mask? The, the, the mask is not going to help you. You need to get out of the smoke and to safety. The same CDC is allowing this urban legend that the mask will protect you from viral particles, which are 10 times smaller than smoke particles. So this is nonsense. This is nonsense. Who's calling the shots? We need people in the chain of command, both in the civilian world and the military world, right? Your local, local county commissioners who are wearing masks and mandating masks, your university presidents who are mandating masks uh, for, for the vaccinated, unvaccinated only right now. Um, th this is hysteria. We need people to get back to, to science and, and ask, is science really calling the shots here? Because I, I don't see the evidence. Where is the evidence that the masks are helping anything? Yeah, I, I always think back to even just this past year, because um, prior to COVID, we had all the randomized controlled trials available, showed pretty conclusively that masks are ineffective at preventing disease, especially cloth masks are completely ineffective, if not more harmful with regards to disease. And then the, the narrative was, well, we don't have anything on COVID. The SARS-CoV-2 is a different virus, blah, 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 blah. Then the Danish study came out, which showed pretty conclusively that masks do not help the person wearing them. So then the narrative switched to, oh, it's not intended to help the person wearing them. It's intended to help other people. But now we see the messaging from the director of the CDC, who is saying the reason that unvaccinated need to continue wearing masks is to protect themselves. The people who have received the vaccine, they're completely fine. The unvaccinated need to keep wearing masks to protect themselves. I'm like, wait a minute. Did, wasn't your response to the Danish study that masks are not intended to protect the wearer? They're only designed to protect the people who uh, are around the person who could be sick that is wearing the mask. The flip-flops throughout this whole thing, it's so unbelievably clear that this is not driven by science. And then what is happening at West Point with regards to the shot is also extremely clear that it is not driven by science. And I think one of the things that you wrote in your article, Pam, uh, on, the, on the West Point article specifically, is that there's a 97% uptake. And according to their logic, with regards to herd immunity, you have already clearly, clearly passed that threshold. So what is the issue here? Why are these cadets who are within their right to deny this product and the IG has already said that they should not be discriminated against, nor create the appearance that they're being discriminated against. And they, we've already surpassed that. Um, why is this happening? It makes no sense. And it is not driven by science whatsoever. Well, and dare I say that this mask mandate on cadets is the chain of command just hazing them. Yeah. It's hazing them. Yeah. The two of you, I mean, could you imagine Beast Barracks wearing a mask during your cadet basic training at West Point could, I mean. On a 12 mile ruck march with 50 pounds on your back, your whole kit on? No, no way. I mean, I was a, a good runner as, a, you know, a plea and I struggled with the terrain. I, you know, I moved from a flat area to a mountainous area. And I, I mean, I struggled on those runs in that first summer 
going up and down hills and in a mountainous area. And I can't even imagine staying in formation or keeping up with a mask on in the heat and the humidity and the stress. And, you know, you miss a few runs, you, you're disqualified. You could be, you know, removed from your appointment at the academy. And, I mean, the implications are, one, it's not healthy to have our soldiers running in masks and breathing their CO2. It's not, I mean, who, what we really need is we need some, all those people who are hardcore risk assessment people, like every unit in like the 90s adopted, like we must have a risk assessment officer at every it's event. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I where are they? Where are those people who were a thorn in our sides when we were commanders that were telling us you need more water on location, you know, Captain Long, because people are going to dehydrate. Those same people are saying nothing about we could kill someone running you know, or doing a 12 mile road march with a mask over their face. Where are those risk assessment officers now? Where did they go? I think it's crazy because when you're <laughs> like you're in, you're in the artillery, it's like everyone's a safety officer. Quote, <laughs> everyone's yeah, three yeah. points of contact. You know, like all the things, all the way down to like how you hold balance. You know, climbing on heavy equipment, carrying stuff. There's there's risk everywhere, right? And I I. I wanted to ask you, Pam, because it does go down the chain of command. And I know you've had conversations with, you know, multiple cadets, but also I think you've had conversations with officers as well, like those that can't really speak out and those that or, or, or won't because they'll sacrifice their entire career. But I'm curious what their experience has been at West Point. It's so disappointing. But first of all, I want to say to these cadets, there are officers there who are fighting for you, who are not uh, choosing this product. And they are working behind the scenes as, as some civilians are. So what I'm hearing from some of the officers who are assigned to West Point right now is that they, one in particular, um, when he's pretty convinced he had COVID during the year, past year, he went to a civilian provider off post and received an antibody test. He has the antibodies and he took them back on post and the, the facility on post refuses to include those in his medical record. He is um, leaving West Point, um, it, you know, they, they're only there for a few years. He's on the way out. So he's biding his time and hoping that they will be added to his medical record at his next duty station. But in the meantime, he is encouraging cadets um, in their free choice to opt out of this product and counseling them on their rights when they come to him. He is mandated to wear a mask despite everyone in his department um, is vaccinated and they, and they all know he's not, and that's a whole nother issue. There's a list that's been leaked um, so there's no HIPAA privacy protections. And um, he must close his door to his office um, because he's unvaccinated and everyone else in his department is vaccinated. So, I mean, these are punishments. This is coercion. This is not, he's not a risk. He has the antibodies. And um, another cadet told me when she um, was positive for COVID, her civilian provider um, this is actually secondhand information. She didn't tell me this directly, but I have this through another person um, that Colonel Dawson at the hospital, the West Point Hospital, told her, I don't know why you came here to get a PCR test. Now, remember, we've been encouraging the whole world to PCR test as many times as possible and as frequently as possible. And it's it's a free for all. Don't worry about the cost or just test, test, test. She shows up to test. She's pretty certain she has COVID. She has a severe case. And she is basically told, don't think that that PCR test is going to prove in the future that you had the infection and now you're immune and you don't need the vaccine. Kind of mixed messaging there. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> Very mixed messaging. It's like we this this is the end all be all determinant of, of whether you've had COVID or not. And like the data, this is what's bolstering up all the data in one hand, but then on the other hand, when it's convenient, it's like, Oh, that's completely inaccurate. We're not going to use that anymore. It's like, which one is it? And it's, that's what we've seen so much throughout this whole thing. And Pam, I, I wanted to, to touch on um, your, your conversations with cadets uh, specifically. Uh, I don't know how many you've been in contact with, but I know you've talked with a few 
and some of the other things that they've said with regards to their experience, even, even throughout the academic year, because right now we're in the middle of summer training for cadets, but throughout the academic year when, it, when it's come to this vaccine, because I know as Stan brought up originally, there was there's 700 cadets who did not want the shot. Um, and then just this coercion and repeated messaging over and over again, um, if, you, if you could touch on all that. Well, um, I do believe based on these messages and conversations that many of those 700 were that uh, were unvaccinated that eventually did get vaccinated that their graduation was threatened that their career was was threatened um by the chief medical officer who had approval authority on you know when you when you depart the academy to graduate you have to clear you know medically mm -hmm. that you're you're healthy and fit otherwise you would be chaptered out just like a regular soldier or service member in the military. And so I do believe based on these, um, right now they're anecdotal, I'm hoping cadets will move forward with IG reports and make them official, get them verified. Um, some of these, now we're talking about second lieutenants. They have graduated, they've been commissioned. I do believe a lot of those graduations were threatened. Um, imagine that, that you put in the four years at this institution and one person um, basically gets to decide if, if you get to graduate or not. And that person is not even an infectious disease specialist. Um, that's insulting to me, but I, I, I'll move on from there. But um, parents should be outraged. And the cadets that are currently there are telling me about these, some of them have been in total accumulation quarantine this year since January, over 30 days. Because if you have very limited leave from the academy, you might, you know, have a week at Christmas, maybe a week in the summer, or maybe a couple of four-day weekends. And a lot of that didn't happen because of COVID. So, you know, you're looking at it, you, maybe you had two weeks of leave this year, but you had to spend half of it in quarantine if you're unvaccinated, even though you weren't sick, even though you have antibodies, even though your PCR tested negative. I mean, we're taking our soldiers and putting them in isolation by themselves, which again, going back to that risk assessment, who is conducting the risk assessment on mental health for this age group? No one. You, I mean, we're putting adults in that age group, the most vulnerable age group, 18 to 24, in isolation by themselves for no reason. It's unnecessary. They are not a risk to themselves or others. But, but now they are, and if you look at the mental health lens, and so can you imagine spending 30 days of the last year in isolation? It's been a hard year. Yeah. Uh, so we have this, and that I, what I'm hearing through and seeing through some of these memorandums and policies, the masking will continue for the unvaccinated going into the academic year. The quarantining, the restrictions on leave, even um, a text message about creating separate locker rooms for athletes. And, you know, these are cadets compete in division one sports. Mm -hmm. um, and so could you imagine this overflowing to all of our civilian universities that the unvaccinated have separate bathrooms? What does that remind you of? What period in history does that remind you of? We're talking yeah. like Jim Crow laws here. So clear. So the whole clear. concept of like medical apartheid is, is something that inspired a letter for me, you know, like I, I love, I, I don't know if you remember like uh, General Chrisman back in the day, like his, he was a superintendent. He was so charismatic and you see him and you're just like, holy cow. Like the superintendent is like ripping his shirt off. He's like at football games, doing push ups. like the, the level of influence these members, these leaders have on these 4,000 cadets is in this small microcosm of the army is so amazing. I, I I look back on it in many respects, like holy cow, like I don't I don't know how you get to that level, right? Three star, two star, one star, etc. And the top two officers at West Point today, from a military perspective, are people of color. They're both men of color, and I I, I wrote a letter to them because I was inspired by my time going to Memphis, visiting my sister, baby shower, all that stuff, super amazing, but. We went to the National Civil Rights Museum, which is Lorraine Motel, which is where Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And 
like I didn't even think it was even possible to broach the subject of not having a mask or honoring a medical exemption because as soon as I brought it up, it was like, like there was a complete, like couldn't talk to a manager. There was no, but like, there was no concept at all that there's a, there's a, there's a segregation. There's a tiering of society. There is not respecting people's, you know, choice to do certain things. And then it, it led me to this, like understanding at, at West Point, it's like, they're just, it's just marching in right? The segregation, the humiliation, the separation of like, uh, is it, is water fountains next? You know, is, is, I don't, I don't know exactly what is it, is it going to be in the mess hall, like the wing or the table that has the unvaccinated? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, like, if people recognize the severity of even this one thing being not just marched in, but completely command, like it, it is, it is a command from the top down and then spread all the way throughout that. Like you're saying with these, I want, I want people to understand that. Like when you say they threaten graduation and you're a $500,000, you know, investment from the government, it's not like you just say, Hey, I'm out of here. You probably get some sort of medical disqualification, some sort of like, and you don't get a dishonorable discharge because you're not in the army yet, but you pay back that money. You owe the government for what you actually costed taxpayers. Right. And and all in all in all, right? But you have one specific um, source that told me uh, their brother was going into his first year and he was told, if you don't get this vaccine, you will pay back $300,000. Yeah, it's unbelievable. The weight on, on, a, on a 20, 21, 22-year-old, right? Possibly. It, maybe their prior service, maybe a little bit older. Mm-hmm. But the weight of that on a college graduate, granted, you know, that's what I look at. It's like college grad, college students versus like the cream of the crop military leaders like you have to look at it from both ends and at both ends that you look at this, these atrocities are, they, they should be humiliating to people like the commandant and the suit should be. Yeah. And you know, it's so frustrating is like the, the definition of discrimination is the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people or things, especially on the grounds of race, age or sex. But th- this is an example of this. And what we have, and Pam, you were the one that found this is a Sergeant major at a unit at JBLM, who, uh, and that's Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington. They are currently on a rotational deployment to Germany and Poland. And in an email that he sent to his unit, this is what he said. I've heard some grumbling that we are purposefully discriminating against soldiers who opted out of the COVID vaccination. You're absolutely correct. You are being discriminated against. That is a language that this Sergeant Major chose to use. He is actively saying that they are discriminating and that they are promoting the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people. Um, and it's, it's just like you said, Stan, considering that the superintendent of West Point and the commandant are both men of color and considering the history, the, the horrible history uh, of the United States of, of anything based in discrimination, this is really disturbing to see this. And the response that I see quite often, even the replies on, on Pam's post or some of her articles that are written on children's health defense or, you know, some of the comments on mine or Stanton's posts is, oh, they knew what they were doing. This is what they signed up for. This is what the Army does, blah, blah, blah. And that is completely untrue because, again, this product is approved, not approved. It is approved under emergency use authorization. And these cadets, these service members are fully fully within their rights to say no to this product. Well, and could I, if, if that's not appalling enough that they are within their rights and their rights are being violated and people who are not familiar with the military need a new understanding of that. They are not government property without rights. They have some different regulations and restrictions on what they can say politically and things they can do in public and in and out of uniform. But now we are seeing, I'm getting reports daily from family members saying in the military, we cannot attend our child's graduation at basic training or a school graduation, a, a military school. These are prestigious events. These are, these are honorable events. These are God bless America, red, white, and blue. 
everyone shows up. There, I've never seen a, a soldier who graduated from a school or a basic training or West Point not have a crowd of people there cheering for them and their accomplishments. And to think that now we're saying your family cannot come unless they show proof of vaccination, that, that should scare people. Because now it's your civilian kid, right? If he's at a university, the university can now say, well, West Point doesn't allow unvaccinated people at their vac- at their graduations. Why should we? I mean, this is, this is virtue signaling from the highest level of our institutions that are supposed to set the standard for duty, honor, country. And we're going backwards at a rapid pace unless we create backlash to the chain of command, to our local leaders, to our university presidents. And, and social media is not enough. Like Stanton said, we need to write letters. We need to make phone calls. We need to make office visits because this is out of hand already. Pam, you, you were telling me in a, in a phone conversation about, because because that's really important, right? So the military, a military organization can then make restrictions on civilian family members like that's really important to pay attention to because typically like it's like the spouse or or the family like they don't have the same regulations to abide by like the typically that's that's just the case and there's specific regulations here and there and 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 privileges and things like that you you mentioned something like even restricting housing like bah like they're, they're leveraging not just the ability to go to the gym or to the to the defac or to the commissary they're literally leveraging housing payments that are not just their obligations by the military to provide for the health and well-being of families i have one report and i don't have the unit name in front of me but a major division i'm not a small unit um declaring from the chain of command that if your family decides not to get vaccinated that they can remove your um, basic assistance allowance for housing. It has different names like BAH and BAH that that don't matter to civilians. But so what you need to understand there is, so there's a long-term program in the military where we don't have enough housing for families on post and we never have. And so we supplement the income of our armed service members with an additional housing allowance so they can live off post in civilian housing. They can buy or rent a house and they get additional income for that. Whereas if they were able to live on post, it would be provided by the military and free. So we are now saying from a major division that if your family is not fully vaccinated, we will not allow you the, the basic housing allowance that you've had your entire career um, which is blatant discrimination. And uh, it, it, all of these things will have to be challenged in court, unfortunately, because some, it's again, it's that one person in the chain of command who will disapprove that housing allowance for your family, and now your family is homeless. They can't afford to live off post in some of these, you know, some of these, if you live in the South, maybe you can swing it for a while, but some of these other places like in Virginia, you're not going to be able to afford to live in off post housing near the post within driving distance that you need to get there every day at 5 a.m. for PT. That's just the reality of it. They're just going to make on-base housing for unvaccinated, right? <laughs> well, it's unbelievable. And, and, and do you think anyone who is unvaccinated wants to live in the housing that is uh, declared, you know, the quarantine housing for, I mean, what we are, what that would be, is, would be the creation of ghettos, right? By definition, that we're saying you're not fit to live in, you know, the vaccinated housing, that and you can't afford to live off post. So now you must live in this, you know, this ghetto that we have created for people who we are portraying as disease carriers. Again, historically, what does that remind you of? We have laws that say we cannot discriminate in housing based on skin color and a whole long list of things. So now we're saying by your medical status that we can we can direct the only options you have where you can live. This is appalling. You know, Pam, I think, think about um, choosing the hard right over the, the easier wrong, which we are taught so much at West Point. And I'm sure there's there's people um, that will listen to this that are either in the military, 
um, or, or people that are at West Point, civilians, civilian contractors, what would be your message to them um, for those who agree with what we're talking about right now, but have remained silent so far? Um, what would your message be? And, and, or even for those who uh, are just going along with this, knowing that they have a lingering feeling in the back of their mind that something is incorrect here. Well, I, I really have to address an apathy is listening right now. So, you know, I've been advocating on these issues for a decade and um, the infringements on our rights. And so typically it's been about 3% of people who have engaged on this issue who, and then, the, you know, the rest of the population is, is hoping that that 3% will complete the mission, that they will secure their freedoms. And up until now, uh, in most states, not in California and New York, we've been able to protect exemptions for mandated or recommended vaccines on the typical childhood schedule. But now you see this aggressive front, right? We're talking an aggressive move um, that we need to engage differently. We, and, you know, and lawmakers will tell you that, you know, apathy is so rampant in, in our political arena, in our democracy, that 15 emails will get their attention. 15 from an entire state. Then they know, whoa, we have a problem here and this might affect my reelection. So we really need like 15 people in each state to uh, contact their US representative, their US senator, because they have oversight responsibilities over the military. And they can say, these are my constituents. They're concerned about how these cadets are being treated at West Point or in any military unit that is, you know, you know, you're hearing these stories. I'm reporting on them from different units. We, we need a report. We need accountability. I want to come and see this for myself. And when that happens, when you get your U.S. senator or representative involved, things start to happen quickly because the military does not want oversight. They do not want that senator coming down and taking pictures with their press team and reporting on it in social media. They, they want to conduct business as usual and they don't want any interference and they definitely don't want their funding affected. So all of these, this new engagement has to be the average person that says, you know, maybe I don't, I'm not ready to believe that this could happen in my local community, but you know, maybe I should go ahead and make sure it stops where it is right now because it's, it's concerning, it's alarming. And that's what I would encourage all the apathy listening of people who don't traditionally write letters or phone calls or get involved in politics, that the time has changed. The signals are there, that we are moving at a fast pace. The enemy is moving in at a fast pace. And, and not everyone has to have the same reason for being concerned. Your concerns could be for the in individuals, for these cadets and their medical freedom. That is definitely a concern. But it could also be for everyone's freedom you know, that this is, the, that laws are not being followed, that coercion, discrimination, um, you know, that how does this make us look to the rest of the world mm -hmm. and from a force protection point of view, that are we afraid of our own brothers in uniform? I mean, really, I mean, so I was telling someone yesterday, in short, that up until now, talking about the science has not made an impact talking about your legal rights has not made an impact because we're in such a state of hysteria. And when you're dealing with narcissists and egomaniacs who are just chasing that top block, you really have to go to shaming tactics of how, how shameful this is and how it makes us look weak to our enemies, that we're fearful of our brothers and sisters in uniform. And that, you know, I made, I made a comment the other day that, so what, a homeless camp could overtake our military right now if they were unvaccinated? Would we just flee? Would we, you know, retreat because they're not vaccinated? I mean, think of how this makes us look in the eyes of, of militias, of other countries, of terrorist cells, that we are afraid of each other. So, I mean, so everyone has to pick their own messaging, but I would say right now that the science and personal rights have not mattered. So maybe we need to change our messaging a bit that, um, that this is shameful and makes us look weak. You know, I was in the army for, for most of COVID and luckily I'm out now because witnessing from the inside how weak and afraid the army appeared with regards to this whole last year and a half was truly unbelievable. Um, just the fear that was being perpetuated at the, the unit level um, and how afraid people were acting and so irrationally, 
with regards to, again, going back to the data, going back to the science, which the Army is supposed to be so driven by conducting these cost-benefit analysis and uh, or analyses and, and coming to a conclusion thereafter. And I didn't see any of that. And it was really, really, really disheartening. And, you know, this this <laughs> docu-series that I've watched uh, several times now and then, I, I really am seeing it play out. It really looks like the communist subversion of America. That's like what we are witnessing right now. That's that's such a crazy because like you're saying, what what would you say it was Russia, China, and who? That North guys, Korea. North Korea, right? Like yeah. when we were in, it was like the Balkans. It was um, you know you go to the range and it's all like. Russians, you know, at, at, at the shooting range, <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, yeah, I don't know if you had it had Atropia as the fake place that you always uh fought, but that's like been the thing at least since I've been in. You I don't know if it was that developed back then. Atropians, <laughs> is that what it was called? I can't yeah. remember. But I think about this because it used to be so commonplace. Like, what are you, communists? You know, and it's like, it, it because, and then it becomes a bromide. It becomes just a saying. It, 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 it deconstructs, like, the actual dichotomy of, like, a, a, a society, a free society, a personal sovereign, inalienable right society versus what exists in most of the world. And, I mean, I wouldn't be here if America wasn't the beacon of freedom for the world. And because both... And they actually chose to emigrate to California, right? My dad's side is from China. My mom's side is from Taiwan. Both sides hate communist China. And it's it's wild to think that their whole process of emigration, I wouldn't have existed. My grandfather wouldn't have fought in World War II for our side. I wouldn't have gone to West Point. I wouldn't have had this whole history of understanding, like, just the the black and white nature of what free versus oppression, free versus tyranny is. Like you can't, in my view, I cannot remove that lens, but it is being completely dismantled and completely normalized. And I say sometimes completely celebrated now, like you're saying, like we're we're firing 30 kilometers, 155 millimeter paladin rounds to essentially destroy the enemy but if that enemy in the ground combat is unvaccinated like we run, we run, run, back, run away from go them. to your go to your like quarantine yeah. tent like what do you do like you, you like it's crazy to me that your pulse of what's happening in the military zero critical thinking zero harder right versus easier wrong but at the end of the day like you're saying pam at the end of the day, it comes down to being a human. It comes down to actually our biology, our, our neurology, our neurodevelopment is actually, it needs to critically think. It must critically think. And we can't actually lose that ability to critically think. And so whether it's, uh, whether it is principally on, on freedom versus oppression and segregation, whether it's you know, just combat readiness, whether it's actually like you're saying, like, what are we looking at? How do we view from the outside world? What is America and what is the greatest institution, leadership institution probably in the history of America look like as a result of this level of behavior? At the end of the day, it comes down to, it can come down to a team leader protecting his plebe. It could come down to a squad leader protecting a squad, a platoon leader, platoon sergeant. Like, at every level, it can come down to that tack, like the tactical officers, the tack NCOs and the tack, the tack officers, because obviously the leadership is captured. And at the end of the day, I don't know how they do.